Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Today, we're taking a look at the second TRS-80 Model 100 that a friend of mine sent me to be repaired. This is the one that has the mangled option ROM socket, so we'll take a look at that and probably just replace it with one from a parts donor board. I also don't think this one's been recapped, which is really important on these guys. So we'll take a look at that and I'll show you some of the alternative methods for pulling the caps off of these boards, which can be kind of difficult. And then we'll try out the Super ROM and Rex CPM that he sent along and see how those work. Well, let's jump right in. I was recently ordering a couple circuit boards for a project from PCBWay. And when I was on their website, guess what I saw? I found that PCBOA was having a big sale. There's all sorts of Christmas coupons, drawings, year-end sales, Christmas projects, all sorts of things. So when you're needing your next circuit boards, go to PCBWay and have a look. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. Well, let's get started here. Well, first thing I always like to do on these guys oh, is pop this battery compartment open, and this one's being difficult. There we go. It's got some batteries in it. And then I like checking out the battery compartment to make sure it is not leaked. And this one looks nice and clean. That's good. And we'll pop open our option ROM socket. Oh, this cover is a little cracked. It looks like it's been... I was going to say somebody cut that and modified it, but that really looks like a factory piece, or somebody did a super fine job cutting it. And it has some sort of zero insertion force socket added here for the system bus connector. The system bus connector is like bringing out the main bus on the computer to the outside world, and you could connect this to a like an external disk drive and video display unit with a ribbon cable. It was basically a, a dip socket. This is like a 40 pin dip socket under here. It was kind of inconvenient. And they had not seen anybody add a ZIF socket to it. Oh yeah, there is our mangled option ROM socket. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're just going to replace that guy. We'll get this board out of here and then we'll get a close up look at that. So we just have the four cover screws. Just notice this has a little dent in this end. It looks like it was dropped at one point in time, but it didn't really crack the case or anything. To separate the case on these, it's really handy to have a plastic spudger tool. If you slide it down the middle here, You'll feel where the tab is and do the same thing on the side and on that side. And it'll pop loose very easily. Yeah, so says me. Back edge on this one's being difficult. Oh, you know what? Our ZIF socket is hanging over the edge here. So we're not going to be able to get the case off without getting that ZIF socket out of there. don't like using a hard screwdriver shaft to pry against the case. A plastic spudger is a little better for that. It won't make a divot in the case. It's snap back together. There we go. Much, much better. It is still hanging up on the back. What is up with that? Right. Okay. I'll just fold that open like a book, just like that. Okay, quick visual inspection before we go any further. Not 
a lot of terrible looking leaking cap damage. These do look like the original caps. They have been linking a little bit. You can see it on the silk screen. I showed you this trick last time. Needle nose pliers. Just not touching the board, just the edges of the connector there so you can wiggle it out. And then we will get our other connectors off of there. And power connector comes off there, then we've got a ground connector that comes off like that. And we have screws holding the PCB down. So we've got our PCB out now. We definitely have our original caps and the NICAD battery in here. So we'll have to pull those out. And if we flip it over, we see a pretty typical backside of these boards. You can see how shiny it is. That is from the coating of nasty flux these guys always have on them. If you try to clean it off there with just alcohol, there's a good shot of it. You can see how dirty it is right there. If you try to clean it off with just alcohol, you wind up with this white streaky mess that's kind of nasty. Yeah, there we can kind of see what happened. A lot of the fingers here are bent. I think this happens when you have a ROM module that goes down in too far and it goes past this rounded bottom edge and when you try to lift it out it's catching here so it kind of pulls up on these you know if it stays in this area then you don't have a problem if it goes under it then you're kind of stuck and you have to try to compress these guys while you're lifting it out it's a pain in the butt if we take a close-up look around some of the capacitors, at first glance, this looks pretty decent. See how easy the silk screen's coming off there. So these little caps always, always leak. We have the same problem around here in the power supply section. Yeah, that's just flaking right off there. Sometimes these two caps Around these guys the problem is we have this huge ground plane on the top of the board that one of the component legs goes through and just working from the bottom of the board it's very difficult to get enough heat up through the through hole to get this side warm enough to melt the solder so we'll just walk the components out to make that job a lot easier but first I'm going to clean all that nasty flux off the back of the board this part is not terribly difficult. We're going to mix one part vegetable glycerin with nine parts denatured alcohol. We'll wipe that on the board, wipe some more on there about every five minutes. And after 15 or 20 minutes, that should have the flux loosened enough on the board that we can clean it off of there. So let's do that. The only thing the glycerin is doing for us is making the alcohol thicker, a little more viscous, so it'll stay in place, not dry out as rapidly. I've got a little brush here I apply it with, and I'll just use that to mix it up. I'll bring our circuit board back in here, and we'll just paint this on there. There we go. Now about every five minutes I'll add some more. Brush that around. This has been soaking oh about 40 minutes now, and I've taken my little brush and alcohol and glycerin concoction here and brushed more on several times. Taking this stiff bristle brush here, gonna cross it a few times, and I set a little rag here at the bottom to catch some of the mess. I'll try to scrape off what I can. I've got a little just pure alcohol in here. Let's splash some of that on there and work it around. Just 
screech all that run off the board onto the rag. Now this is better. It's broken a lot of this stuff up. Man, this one had a lot of flux on it, even more than normal. So it's probably about 50% of the gook we've got off the board so far. So I'll apply some more of the alcohol and glycerin mix and just let it soak on there for a while. It makes the board a lot easier to work on. And, you know, I can go around and do other things in the shop while this thing is being cleaned. So after letting this soak, oh, another 15 or 20 minutes, I flushed it a few times with alcohol, scrubbing in between each time. Uh, you know, holding the board in an angle like this, so it would all run off onto my rag, and you can see how nasty this rag is now. It's actually more yellow than what it looks like on the camera. But this board is still quite wet, but I'll show you a trick I learned from Noelle's Retro Channel. Just take some fresh rags. I'll lay out here on the board. And just brush right over top of the rag. That pushes the rag down over the pins. And picks up the stuff off the board. I thought this was a pretty slick trick. This is all the flux that was cleaned off the bottom of that TRS-80 Model 100 circuit board. This is a new clean white rag for comparison. That's how much junk there is on there. It actually looks worse in person than it does on camera. But it's really a sticky mess. No, there's a little bit on the top of the board, but not as bad. Once we get the caps pulled off of there, we'll give that a little bit of a cleanup too. So this is what our board looks like when we've got all that gunky flux off of there. You can kind of see like up in this corner, how there's kind of this white chalky look. That's what the whole board would look like if you didn't add a little bit of glycerin to the alcohol. Now we still need to pull all the caps and the memory battery off this thing and I went ahead and removed the EEPROM and the three optional RAM modules just to aid in cleaning up after we get the capacitors out of there. Since I'm really familiar with these boards I'm just going to pull all the old capacitors out at once. I made up a capacitor map like this which is color coded and it shows me where they all go. Has the list in here of values, and I have some of these in stock, so it's a lot faster if you're familiar with the board and comfortable just to, to take them all off at once. If it's a board I'm not familiar with, I'm more likely going to take them off one at a time or a few at a time, so I don't get ahead of myself and forget where things go. But I usually make up a map on a new system when I work on it. That way I have it for future reference. I'm going to start with this capacitor right here, and you notice that the leads are actually bent over at 90 degrees and it's soldered through the board. So you can see the leads are on the top and bottom here. So when we walk this out, we're going to heat up the bottom lead, push the capacitor this way, then heat up the top lead and push the capacitor down. Now that'll slowly uh, walk the legs right out of the holes. You don't want to use a lot of force and cause problems, but for some of these difficult to desolder boards, this really works a treat. It also works well if you don't have a desoldering tool. You, know, you can use the soldering iron to get the capacitors out, and then use solder braid or a solder sucker to clear out the holes. So I'm just going to heat up the top here, tilt that over, and I'll do the same with the bottom. Okay, one more on the top. There we go. Now we've got that capacitor out of there. If this was one with a big ground plane on the front side of the board, we could go ahead and desolder that from the top side where we'll have better access to heat up the ground plane. I'm down to the last capacitor on the board that we're repairing. So I'm going to pass on a couple other tips. If you can see, I'm using a small chisel tip. Uh, this isn't really fine soldering. The more surface area on your tip, the more heat transfer, the easier it is to do. Add a little fresh solder to both legs of the capacitor. Now let that heat up all three to five seconds. And do the same thing on the other leg. 
one thing I see people doing is thinking it's a race when soldering and trying to use a really high temperature really fast. And that doesn't really work because you've got to give the time the heat to soak through. And getting it too hot is worse. So there we go. So we have all the capacitors and the memory battery out of this board that we're fixing. And this area doesn't look too bad on first glance. But if we gently scrape this, you can see all of that solder mask is flaking off there. And that's because all of the electrolyte from the capacitor, which is an acid, got under it. So what this means is in order to, to properly clean this up, we need to scrape loose this loose stuff here. And sometimes we'll wind up with something like this diode here. We need to pull one leg of so we can get under it. And then we'll clean this area up around here and areas like the pads here where this little capacitor goes, those are kind of tarnished. So I usually scrape them like so, and then I'll go over it with a fiberglass pin. And then I like sealing in that area, or if it's bad enough, I will tin it and then seal it. And then after the sealant dries, I'll go ahead and put new caps in. To pull this option ROM socket off, the first thing I'm gonna do is put a little fresh solder on every one of these pins. Give it, I don't know, three or four seconds per pin. Not worried about doing a great job soldering here. Just get a little fresh solder and flux in each of these joints, plus a little heat. Because there's some ground plane here and I'm not exactly sure what's under this guy, I'm going to use my little blue heat gun here. This guy, which is only about 350 watts and high, I'm going to put it in low and hold it above here and just heat up this whole area to maybe 80C, 100C. It doesn't need to be real hot. If we get this whole area hot, then not as much heat is going to be drawn away from each joint as we're desoldering that. Now we'll go at it with the desoldering gun. I'm going to give it about three to five seconds to heat. Wiggle a little bit to make sure the pin's loose. We're not going to push down. We're just going to wiggle it side to side. After desoldering all the pins, we want to grab each one with a small pair of pliers like this. Give it a wiggle. Make sure each one's got a little wiggle. If it doesn't, you might have to apply a little more solder and desolder it again. And we can use a screwdriver or a little spudger tool to get under that socket and give it a wiggle. There we go. Oh yeah. Look how much of that nasty flux is left under there. That stuff is just amazing. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and give this board a good washing uh, on the top side, just like we did on the bottom side. After cleaning the board with the alcohol and glycerin mixture, I give it a good spray down with this CRC electronic cleaner. This gets the last little bit of stuff off. Uh, be careful, they also make an electrical cleaner, which is not safe on electronics. It's for like motors and stuff like that, but this stuff works really good. We've got our board all cleaned up now and I've let it set for a couple hours to dry off. And now I'm going to take this circuit overcoat pin. by circuit works, which is part of Chemtronics. These last for quite a while. I've had this one well, more than a year, I think, and I've used it on several projects. Uh, we could also use nail polish. This does a little neater job. It's still easy to use. You want to shake the pin good before using it. If it's coming out too thin, too watery looking, just shake it some more. And then push down on the tip and paint it on, um, kind of like you're using a magic marker. Get a good coat over everything and it kind of self-levels. It does a really good job. I give the green overcoat we've put on here overnight to cure. 
So we are all ready now to install our new capacitors. And I've got my capacitor map. And in addition to the pictures uh, I mentioned taking earlier to denote uh, the positive and negative on the capacitor, so I'm going to wind up scratching off a lot of this silk screen to be able to clean it up. I've scratched it in on my picture here, although it's really kind of difficult to read. And I marked on my bags from Mauser. What does work? So this is A, B, D, and E, which is all four of these across here, which are 10 microfarad, 16 volt. And if I look, I mark the polarity as being negative on the top, positive on the bottom. On these wet type electrolytics, you have a stripe that denotes the negative side. On tantalum capacitors, you'll have a mark that denotes the positive side. So you gotta watch. It may be different than what you think, and they may have marked the positive side on the board and not the negative side. So just take care. But we've got our negative. That goes up. And we can just pop all these guys right into place like this. When I spec out the caps, I try to get ones that have exactly the same uh, pin pitch, the distance between the pins, and the same height and diameter and working voltage to as closely match the originals as possible. Some kits you get, they'll have a different pin pitch, and you've got to squeeze the leads in or spread them out a little bit to make it work. And this list, this capacitor map and list, and it has uh, the Nichicon part numbers here and um, the links to these on Mauser. I'll put this in the description down below. What I'll do is just quickly touch one leg of each capacitor. I'm reach under the reaching under the board here with my fingers. I want to heat that same leg again. And push up from the bottom just to push the cap into place. Leave in there pretty nice. In the last minute squaring up. And then we'll do the other legs. Again, I'm going to stay on these about three to five seconds per leg. It helps you if you have a little, just a tiny bit of solder on the tip of the iron. Put your iron on the lead a little more solder into it and give it a couple seconds. So there you can just kind of see the joints. Those look nice. It's a little bit shiny. Leaded solder should be a little shiny. If the solder is, if it's ball shaped like this, then it didn't flow out good enough. If it comes down like this, then you know you did a good job. And we'll just take our little nippers and clip those leads off. Just like that. And lather, rinse, and repeat for all the other capacitors. This capacitor right here is C83. It's a 470 microfarad cap, which is this guy. And it lays down sort of like this when it's installed. Just take your little pair of pliers, go about well, two millimeters from the end there. Give it a gentle twist like so. There we go. Solder it from the back side just like the rest. Of course, our option ROM socket goes on from the bottom of the board. And you notice there is a pin one indication here. And if we look at the socket itself, it has a notch in one end, two notches in the other end. This notch is the pin one indication. We just pop him on there like that. It's the tallest thing. So I'll just tack either corner. Put my hand up from the bottom there. Heat up both joints again and make sure it's seated. 
And we'll give it a quick peek on the other side. Yep, that looks like it should. And we'll go ahead and finish soldering him up. Again, we're not in a hurry here. Three seconds or so on each pin. After finishing the soldering on the capacitors in the option ROM socket, I cleaned up all the solder joints with some alcohol and a brush. And then I took the knob off of the contrast pot and I took some deoxit like this out to the garage and I go squirt into the contrast pot, all the switches, all the connectors, that type of thing. Work the switches back and forth a few times. That'll help clean up any oxidation, any of the the goop from cleaning everything up that got might have gotten into a switch. Now we're just about at the point where we can test this. Got our machine set up to do a basic power on test. The memory battery is turned on, power switch is turned off, LCD and keyboard is hooked up, and I am using my bench power supply so I can monitor how much current is being drawn. I have the bench supply set to output 6 volts at a maximum of 150 milliamps. I've got the screen there where we can all see it. I'll try turning it on. Yay, it works. Got some keyboard response. And the keyboard seems to be working. So this is good news. Now let's go ahead and get the test harness back out and we'll do a more thorough test of this. Let's go over the test harness real quick. The first board we have is the ROM board, which has its own little LCD. It's got its own EEPROM, a couple switches, and it will connect to either EEPROM pinout variation for both versions of boards. So you can use this by itself to do some basic tests to test all the I.O. You need this interconnect board which connects to the system bus, the serial bus, the printer bus, the barcode reader, and the cassette remote. And it's got various chips and switches to aid in the diagnostics. And then you've got a whole slew of cables to hook things up. For the system bus, the standard system bus connector for the Model 100 looks like this. It is a 40 pin dip socket with a ribbon cable that goes to a 40 pin ribbon cable connector. On the Model 102 you actually have this type of connector sticking out of the back of the machine so you don't need this. This interconnect board plugs right into the Model 102. I think these connectors are kind of a pain. I didn't like working with them. So I made this little adapter board, which plugs into the system bus connector, like this. It has a standard ribbon cable connector here. So then all you need is a standard ribbon cable to hook things up. I find this much easier to work with. Either one will work. You have your serial port cable, which is DB25, to a ribbon cable end. This is just a straight through crimp, easy to make. The printer port connector, which is just another straight through ribbon cable, easy to make. This is for the barcode reader socket. Again, this is just a straight through cable, easy to crimp and make. Then you've got this little cable here, which goes from a post on the ROM board over to one of the pins on one of the ICs, so you have access to a signal that you need. This connector I already had from my logic analyzer, so I just made up this little green wire here out of some scrap wire. And in order to test the cassette remote you need a cassette cable which I didn't have but I had this uh, TI-99 cassette cable lying around and I just made up an adapter cable because I had the parts on hand. So if you've already got the cassette cable you don't need this. Here we have our test harness set up. We've got our interconnection board back here going to all the ports. We have our ROM board plugged into the ROM socket. We've got our LCD and keyboard connected. And we are ready to start the test. I'm going to start the test up here. This is actually the second pass through. On the first pass, I forgot to start the camera. It starts out with the memory test. It's going to test all four modules. And they are all testing good here. Since this is the second test, 
you see that preceding B that tells you it was the second test and the battery backup was good. Well, that is the control bits for the serial port, and those are failing. That's like request to send, clear to send, that type of thing. And this is a serial loopback test, which passes. So we do have the serial port issue there. And here is where you could press keys on the keyboard. Like I'm just pressing the space key there. I was setting up tonight to try to show you how to troubleshoot the problem we were having with the serial port chip over here. And it, the computer wasn't always booting up. And I thought, well, you know, I had the, the ROM board on here and maybe it was a little topsy-turvy, that type of thing. And then it quit altogether. I finally said, well, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the, the basic things. And I used my voltmeter to check for power supply voltages. That was okay. And then I used the scope to check for a clock on the processor. And that was okay. And I was like, okay, what's the next thing? Remember, these are the basic checks. The next thing is reset. Check the reset on the processor. And it's always low. Press the reset button back here. No difference. And I got to studying the reset circuit here on the schematic. And I notice that on the capacitor here, which is one of them I replaced, it's only charging up to about 0.8 volts, which seems a little slow. And of course, when you press the reset switch, that's shorting out across the capacitor and it drops to zero. That's pretty normal. And I checked all of these transistors, you know, in the, with a diode checker on my monometer, and that seemed okay. And then I was kind of, you know, measuring each of them operationally in circuit, and I noticed that on the base of T25 here, I have about 0.6 volts, which is probably enough to turn this guy on, or at least partially on. And if you follow this trace here, it goes over to this flip-flop. The output of this flip-flop is low. And if you measure on both sides of this transistor here, R142, here it's 0 volts, it's low. And here it's 0.6 volts. Well, where in the heck is that 0.6 volts coming from? Well, it's got to be coming through the transistor. It has to be leaking. Uh, that's my theory, anyhow. And it's leaking just enough. It's not really letting this capacitor charge up. So, therefore, none of this other stuff works right. And we're constantly in reset. And what this T25 does is it allows this stuff down here to flip this flip-flop. And it allows the computer, basically, to reset itself. So, what I'm going to do is pull T25 and see if it'll boot up then. Now with T25 removed, we're going to measure across C78, right where the arrow is pointing. And you can see that after turning the computer on, it raises to 5 volts and we're out of reset. Now when I press the reset button, it drops to zero and then comes back to 5 volts as it should. So T25 was definitely leaking, and we'll go ahead and replace it. Okay, we've got the transistor replaced, and I want to hook the LCD up so we can turn it on. So you can see that, yes, it is indeed booting now. So now we can set back up to troubleshoot the serial port problem. Now that we've got that pesky problem with the reset circuit fixed, let's go back and revisit our problem with the serial port. As you might recall, it was failing on the control bits test, specifically the data set ready, data terminal ready loopback when it was trying to write a zero. It was failing, and we see that with the F here. What we don't know is are we not transmitting a zero or are we not receiving the zero? So that's what we'll look at now. Now that we know where our problem lies with the serial port, that is with the DTR DSR loopback line, we know where to look. Now, M35 here is the buffer chip that does the voltage level shifting for RS-232, and that's a good place to start looking. 
So what I've done is set up to measure the DTR signal going into and out of M35, which is pin 5 and 6 here. And I've got that connected to the oscilloscope, where the yellow trace is the signal coming in and the blue trace is the signal going out. So we can see that on the schematic here. This is M35. And we're measuring here on pin 5 and here on pin 6. And it's going out and it's just being looped back. That's just this is connected to this on the interconnect board. So we'll see if we have the signal coming into this and signal coming out of this, which is the DTR signal. And then if we do, we'll do the same thing to see if we have it coming back in. So what I'll do is start the test. It'll take, you know, 30 seconds or so to get to the serial test. And we'll look at the oscilloscope. I've got it set up to trigger uh, when the input changes. So we should see that change. There we go, starting with the RAM test. Okay, here we go. So we see the yellow trace, which is our input. That drops down from about, oh, 5 volts to 0. The yellow trace is 2 volts per division. The blue trace is 5 volts per division, but it didn't change at all. So we've got the input going into the M35 level shifter chip, but we have no output. And, you know, could that be because the output is shorted? Yes, that could be. Uh, one test we could do for that is remove the loopback jumper, which is right here. And we can rerun the same test. Uh, I've already done that, and it doesn't make any difference. There is one interesting thing, though, that I did notice. Let's look at the scope again. Now we have the jumper out and the jumper in. So you can see just having that loop back is putting quite a bit of load on that output buffer. So I'm thinking that means that that output buffer part on that chip is bad. Another test we could do is measure the same thing with the, the RTS or CTS signal. And I've done that and I've done a, a trace capture on the scope. So let's have a look at that. Here we have a scope capture of the RTS output. The input to the buffer chip is on pin 3 and the output is on pin 4. And as you can see, when the input goes high on pin 3, the output goes low on pin 4, so everything is working as it should. This is another good indication that the part of the buffer chip that deals with the DTR signal has gone bad. Well, I swapped in a new serial buffer chip from the parts board. This is the bad one pulled out of the board here we're working on. See, I've got the new one soldered in place. I just soldered it directly to the board. I find that pulled chips don't play with sockets very nice, so I just like to solder them in. We'll see if this did the trick. I've got the test harness all hooked up, and we'll kick it on. Here's control bit set to 1, set to 0. All right, that looks like it passed. Good deal. And we've got the data loopback test. Okay, we've got a working serial port. And here we are at the end of the test where it's testing the auto power off circuitry. Okay, all our tests passed. Now we'll plug in the keyboard and LCD, and we'll give those a try. So now you can see the purpose of those two little circuit boards I showed you at the beginning of the video. They extend out our keyboard and LCD so we can actually use this while we're working on the main board and for testing and all that type of stuff we can actually see what's going on. And they have labeled test points on both of them. For instance, with our test harness here, we'll turn the test harness on. Now it's going to be a little while before anything comes up on the LCD. And it looks like it did reset the LCD. Yep, it did the pattern on there. And it's asking us if the LCD looks okay. Yep, it sure does. It did a good job. And then the next thing we'll be able to do is the key test. See, now when we get on the keyboard test here, I can press each key and it'll give me some feedback tell me what key that it is 
And it's much easier doing it like this than trying to hold the keyboard up, even the function keys here. You can press all the function keys. There we go. So keyboard and LCD also work. And we just let this go a little while without touching any of the keyboard keys and it'll go right on with the rest of the test. I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to get this super ROM to work and not stick in the socket so it would damage the new socket. The problem is the circuit board was going down in there far enough it was catching under the lip like this. And if you tried to pull it up, it would bend these fingers up. Now, this circuit board arrangement is an aftermarket solution. The way these are intended to work is that your EEPROM or ROM would wrap around a carrier like this. And this guy would just plug in here like this, nice and easy. Well, when Kyocera designed the Model 100, they decided to use a non-standard pinout for the socket, which really messed everything up. That was a big disservice they did. So instead of using a standard carrier like this, uh, people had to come up with solutions like this. And you can see here, I'll cut in some video I shot before, that it looked like there was something glued to the bottom of this, and I had some nice folks on the Discord server for the Model 100 and the Model 100 mailing list, send me some photographs. And indeed, from the factory, there is a piece of cardboard on the bottom here. And after trying a few other things, I wound up with some of this double-sided tape and a piece of cardboard, and I cut that to fit. And this is about 2.1 millimeters off the bottom of the circuit board. And it's just enough, it'll fit in the socket, and you can still pull it out with a little guidance from something like a plastic spudger. And it's in there enough that it'll stay and not pop out. I still had the problem, it wasn't making good contact though. And I had really given up, and I thought, well, I'll pull the, the ROM off here and give it a read to see if it's different than what's already out there. And when I started desoldering one of the pins, lo and behold, Solder was sucked out of these castellations. I thought these were almost flat and not like the pictures of other people's. But I went and I sucked all the solder out of those castellations. And now it snaps into the socket really well. The castellations wrap right around the pins and it aligns the pin to the castellation and the good contact is made. And it actually works now. Now to pop this guy in here, we want to look for the end with a little nipple on it. And that goes this direction. And just give it a firm snap down in there. Now this may not come right out every time when we pull on it. If that happens, you can kind of pull on it and push those little fingers back with something like a spudger tool here to get them to pop away from the board and then it'll be fine. So I'll we'll go ahead and power this guy up now. After we install the Super ROM and we turn it on, we need to activate it. And this is the same way with all option ROMs. And it's usually done something like this. We go into basic and we'll type in something like call 63012. Well, it's just like a, a system command on other computers, that type of thing. It calls some machine language code. And that starts it, and it gives us a menu, and it also adds that to the, the main menu. So I'll press F8 to go back to the main menu. And now we see that Super is added to our menu. You can scroll down and select it. And this is where it all went sideways. As I was trying to learn how to use these four programs, the Super ROM stopped making good contact, and I could wiggle it and push it in and pull it out and push it back in, and it would sort of work for a while, and then it would quit working again. So there's something else going on with that carrier PCB, and it's just not working correctly. 
but there are other modern solutions today which might be a good subject of a future video. For now, I'm going to suggest that my friend doesn't use this particular option ROM. Well, I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at these two TRS-80 Model 100s for my friend. Of course, this is the one we did in the last episode. This is the one we worked on this time. And not only did we replace that mangled Molex socket, but we had a couple unexpected surprises. We found we had a bad serial port buffer chip, which we changed. And along the way, we also had the reset fail to reset, thanks to a bad transistor, T25. We got to take a look at the test harness, which is a rather neat piece of diagnostic equipment, as well as the keyboard LCD extension, which is also quite handy. And although we did our best with that Super ROM, we couldn't get it to work reliably, but we sure gave it a good try. If you have an interest in the test harness boards or the LCD keyboard extension boards, just drop me an email. I'll put my address in the description down below. Did you know that only about 50% of you watching right now are subscribed to the channel? If you're not subscribed, well, what are you waiting on? If you look down below, you'll see a rectangular button that says subscribe in it. Well, just click on that guy and it does what you think. And then click on that bell-shaped icon so YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. I want to take a moment to say thanks to everyone who helped support the Hey Bert channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated, and you help keep this channel going. If you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in the comments section down below. I would love to hear from you. And until next time, bye. Oh, 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 oh,